everybody knows how easy it is to talk great about UFC fighters that you love. We can all go on for time about how great a Shavkat Rachmanov, who gets a finish in every single fight, is about Ilya Taporia, Max Holloway, some of the most, you know, loved guys inside the UFC, Charles Oliveira, guys that just constantly go out there and put on fun performances, guys that it's pretty much impossible not to root for. It's so easy to talk great about those guys. It's not as easy to talk right about guys that you don't like. It's not as easy to talk right about the guys that are super, super wrestling heavier, don't get finishes or aren't good on the mic or beat all of your favorite fighters. And that's what we're doing today. We're going through and we're talking nicely about all of my least favorite UFC fighters, which I'm not going to lie. It's not going to be easy to do because pretty much for everybody on this list, I don't actually hate them as a person. I just don't like their fighting style. So I can't go for like Bilal. Oh, well, Bilal is a good person outside of the UFC octagon. Well, who really gives a fuck? They, why I don't like them is inside the octagon. So for all of these fighters, I don't really hate them outside the octagon, but inside the octagon, oh my fucking God. Do I hate them as champions? Do I hate them as former champions? Have they ruined fighters that I love? There's so many guys down on this list. But before we get into it, make sure to like, sub to all that YouTube shit. It truly, truly does have me at a ton. Your one like up straight to 100 more people with the click of a button. And also make sure to subscribe because I think only like 25, 30% of the people that are watching my videos are actually subscribed. So if you're liking the videos, please do subscribe. Let's get right into it though. Starting off, we are going to start off with the man that I mentioned, Merab Valashvili. Merab, why do I not like him? It's just his fighting style. It's his fighting style more than anything else. I don't want to watch somebody go out there and wrestle for 25 minutes with no plans of getting a finish. With Shavkat Rachmanov, I was talking about yesterday, you go into every fight knowing that there's going to be a finish. 18-0, 18 finishes. The history tells you there will be a finish. With Merab, it's the complete opposite. The history tells you there's no way he's going to get a finish. The history tells you he's probably not even going into the fight thinking about a finish. So what do I like about him? One. You have to admire how hardworking he is. He doesn't just have the best cardio in the UFC from pure genetics. I'm sure that he has good genetics. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure everyone in the UFC has good genetics. But how hardworking he is to get that 25-minute cardio, to be able to shoot 50 times against a Piotr Jan, that's exceptional. That's super, super, super impressive. And for not being that great at anything, because now we look around the UFC champions, we're like Drikas Duplessis, you know, even Sean O'Malley when he was there. Pretty much all of those guys are exceptional at everything. Look at Islam Makhachev. Really good kickboxer, elite wrestler, got good judo, got good jiu-jitsu, got good everything. And that's pretty much all the champions inside the UFC, apart from one or two exceptions. Marab doesn't even have the thing that he's really good at. He's not a better wrestler than most of the, you know, elite wrestlers in the UFC. He's definitely not a great striker. He's in the bottom percentages of strikers. But he's still almost impossible to beat. He's weaponized his cardio to a stage that's so, so elite that you're going into a fight against a one-punch KO artist like Sean O'Malley, and he's afraid. He's afraid of getting taken down. He's afraid of getting gassed in that, you know, fourth and fifth round that you have him paralyzed with fear. And if you can do that to everybody in the UFC, if you can do that to the top level guys at the UFC level, you're going to be pretty much impossible to beat. And that's what Mayor Valashvili is. After that, we have Colby Covington. Colby Covington. I don't actually mind Colby Covington's like, you know, kind of the personality that he puts on. We all know it's fake. We all know that's not the real Colby Covington, but I don't really mind that, you know, like do your thing, have your way that you can stand out inside the UFC. The problem that I have with Colby Covington is the ducking. The ducking, the, you know, I don't want to fight Ian Gary and then you're talking shit on social media, but then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, my leg was broken. Oh, my arm was broken. All of this different type of shit. This is why I can't fight Ian Gary. No, I'm not recovered yet. But the one thing that he does do is he's going to get you hyped for a fight. And that's with every single fight, time after time after time after time. I don't believe that that Colby Covington character is his real character. Pretty much everybody knows that that's kind of like a fake character that he puts on. But still, if he's fighting Ian Gary with the back and forth with the shit that they've talked, I was super hyped for that fight. I was like, yeah, bro, please give us that fight. Think about the beef. Please give us that fight. Then you look at the Kamaru Usman fights in the past. I was hyped for all of those. You look at the Leon Edwards fights in the past, especially when he started talking shit at those press conferences. I was super hyped for that. So in a division like 170, when there wasn't a whole lot of convincing challengers during that Kamaru Usman reign, he still made every single fight hype. He still made every single fight super, super fun. He makes every press conference super, super entertaining. And although he's a wrestling heavy guy, he can still throw down. He can still, you know, stand on the feet and really, really put it on people. And he's also a super, super hard worker, which is shown in his gas tank. And also he fights at his natural weight. He fights at his actual natural weight of 170 pounds, which is honorable. It's not smart. Don't get me wrong. It's not smart, but it's definitely honorable. After that, we have Hamza Chimaev. Hamza Chimaev. 
for him, it's just the fact that he pulls out of fights. That's why I don't like Hamza Chamaev. It's kind of like Colby Covington, almost in that similar vein. Colby Covington just straight up denies them and ducks them. But with Hamza Chamaev, we just see now so often, we get to the very, very end of a fight card where we're like, oh shit, Hamza Chamaev, man, we're going to get to watch Hamza fight again. And all of a sudden he pulls out. Or all of a sudden, you know, he's missed weight by eight pounds and now we have to watch Kevin Holland and Hamza Chamaev instead of the match we're going to get to watch. And he's making the UFC reshuffle their entire card. And it's not reporting shit to the UFC. Hamza Chamaev, it's not even the fact, like we've seen a lot of fighters pull out of fights. We've seen a ton of it. But it's three weeks before. It's four weeks before. It's even, you know, like a month, a month and a half before. Listen, he's not going to be able to make the fight. Let's reschedule it for a different date. Hamza Chamaev, he trains through whatever kind of crazy injury he has, whatever kind of, you know, chest shit that he has. And then we end up with him three days before the fight, four days before the fight, when he tries to cut weight, nearly dying because he just doesn't do the smart things. But Hamza Chamaev, what do I like about Hamza Chamaev? It's almost like, what is there not to like about Hamza Chamaev? If you can get him inside the cage, if we can truly get Hamza Chamaev to get inside the cage and be healthy and, you know, have the weight cut done right, He's so much fun. He has maybe the highest potential in the entire UFC. We've heard stories of him, you know, out wrestling UFC heavyweights. We've heard stories of him ragdolling UFC heavyweights. We know that, you know, Drikis Duplessis, Kai O'Brien, all of these guys, Sean Strickland, he sparred in their gyms. And those guys are saying, my hardest spar is Hamza Chemaev. The hardest guy that I've ever sparred is Hamza Chemaev. So the potential is there. He could be great. He could be so, so, so good if he could just make it to a fucking fight, man. After that, we have probably the person on this list that I dislike the most. I'm going to be honest with you. Probably the person on this list that like I really, really, really don't like Raquel Pennington. Raquel Pennington is the current 135 pound champion. There's not very much to like about her. The fighting style, no. On mic, she is the worst ever champion we've ever had on the mic. I genuinely think I get more enjoyment out of UFC fighters that cannot speak English than I do Raquel Pennington, who can speak English. I get more enjoyment out of fighters that just don't say anything than Raquel Pennington. She kind of does this like weird nonchalant act, but it just comes off like, bro, you just sound like a fucking dick. Like, you just sound like a dick anytime you talk. And she's not fun inside the cage. She's not fun inside the cage. Has, like, a super boring, wrestling, heavy, but no finishes style. And the nice thing that I can say about her is she's maximized her career. There's some guys inside the UFC where we look at, you know, like, busts inside the UFC that just didn't really live up to their potential, that we thought were going to be triple champs, that we thought were going to be double champs. Like a Hamza Chamaev, people were talking about triple champ by now already. If you're talking about four years ago, people would have 100% thought that Hamza Chamaev would be a UFC champion by now. But he hasn't lived up to the potential. With Raquel Pennington, it's the opposite. She's maximized her career for how bad she is. Because my God, she is, uh, she's not great. She's not great at all. After that, we have the current 170 pound champion and it's Bilal Muhammad. I was talking about how Bilal Muhammad does a lot of great stuff outside of the cage, which I truly, truly do believe he does. Bilal seems like a nice guy. He seems like an actual good guy. But inside the cage, no. I'm not a fan of Bilal inside the cage. We all know the reasons why. I think that his personality is bad. I think that his performance against Leon Edwards was good. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think that Leon Edwards was at 100%. And even with Leon Edwards not being at 100%, and even with Gilbert Burns having one arm, he still cannot seem to get finishes inside the UFC, which is something that I hate. But you have to applaud Bilal for taking his chance. The most pressure on that night in that arena was not Leon, was not Tom Aspinall, was not Paddy Pimblett all walking out in front of home crowds. It was Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad walking out against a crowd that hates him. Walking out knowing this is my one chance. I'm 35 years old. The stats are against me. Everything is against me. But I'm still going to do it. And that's clutch. That's that ice factor, that clutch factor going up against a pound for pound number three in Leon Edwards in your one shot. Because bear in mind, if he loses this fight, he never gets a title shot again. He's not fun enough on the mic. He's not got an entertaining personality. He's, you know, not got a fun fighting style by any means. So this was his one chance and he put on a masterful performance. He put on a super, super clutch performance for his only chance at a UFC title. So if nothing else, you do truly have to respect that. You have to respect that Blah Muhammad, they gave him his shot. They gave him his chance at the king and he did not miss. After that, we have the only non-current fighter on this list. And I have to put him down here because I feel like if I'm doing a video, I'm talking about fighters that I hate and giving props to fighters that I hate. He has to be down here. People would be calling for me to put him down here if I didn't put him down here. It's TJ Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw. There's so much to dislike. There's so much to dislike about TJ Dillashaw. He ruined one of my favorite fighters. 
he's a drug cheat, which, you know, there's a few people in the UFC that are drug cheats, so it brings you down, but it does make me just automatically hate you. But ruining Cody Garbrandt because you're a drug cheat, then we have snaking your own gym. Like, there's so much just reprehensible shit that TJ Dillashaw has done. But, but, after saying all that, and I still don't like the guy, he's one of the only UFC fighters, him and Rakel Pennington, that I actually really hate. I don't like him as a person. I don't like him as a fighter. But he does have probably the most fun fighting style on this list. The reasons why I dislike TJ Dillashaw are, once again, they're outside of the cage. Once you get him inside the cage, if we just take away everything else, which it's hard to do, take away everything that I know about TJ Dillashaw, if I'm just to watch him inside the cage, he does have a fun fighting style. He does, you know, have KO power. And one of the only guys at 135 in that time and at 125 when he went down for one fight that would have KO power in those divisions and he's not a wrestling heavy guy. His prime was super, super high. And you could, if you've been, you know, kind of like swapped to the dark side, you could make an argument for him being a top three bantamweight of all time. I don't want to hear any goat bantamweight discussions. Do not throw him in there. Don't throw him in there. Don't try it. But you could make an argument for him being a top three bantamweight of all time. After that, we have Armin Sarukian. Armin Sarukian. Why do I not like him? Armin Sarukian might be the biggest dick inside the entire UFC. Like most UFC fighters, you'll see them kind of beef on the stage like a Colby Covington. But when you bring him away from that scenario, he doesn't really give a fuck. He's not, you know, going out there being like, oh yeah, I fucking hate Kamaru Usman. I hope Kamaru Usman gets knocked out in every fight to his friends. Armin Sarukian, when Bobby Green got knocked out and when Bobby Green had, you know, that really late stoppage, one of the worst stoppages in UFC history, Armin Sarukian went on the next day, went on Ariel Hawani show and said that, like, he hoped that he got hit with an extra few punches and that he hoped he has brain damage. That's not cool. That's just super not cool over a little beef that they had inside, like, the PI or the hotel or wherever they had their little beef. Then you have him punching a fan in his walkout to Charles Oliveira. I also don't fuck with that. Then you have him and his team doing the like crying face to Charles Oliveira after he got the loss against Armin Sarukian in a close fight. That shit's crazy. That shit's crazy. And that's why I don't like Armin Sarukian. But with all of that, he does have some things that are likable. He does have some things that I do like. He's a possible pound for pound number one. And I say that because he's probably the only competition to Islam Makachev. If he wasn't there at 155, Who's the title challenger? We're running back Charles again. Fuck it, maybe Justin Gaethje, Max Holloway, I don't know, Benoit St. Denis. Just find somebody for Islam to fight. He's the pound for pound number one. We've got no challengers. He is the competition. He is the guy that we're all going into that fight seriously thinking. Islam's going to be a favorite, don't get me wrong. But we're all going into that fight seriously thinking. Armin Sarukin could get that done. Armin Sarukin could beat Islam Makachev. And that's a good thing to have in the division because it's, you know, it's one of the worst things when we think about Tom Aspinall in the future, like who could beat him? At least Islam has real competition and that real competition is Armin Sarukian. After that, we move on to the heavyweight division. We all know that I don't like the heavyweight division. Anybody that watches my videos knows that, you know, in fact, I really, really dislike the heavyweight division. There's so much to hate about the heavyweight division and they're going to get a lot of airtime in this video. Heavyweight's going to get a lot of airtime in this video. I have two fighters down here for heavyweight. The first one is Shamil Gaziev. Shamil Gaziev, he is everything that I dislike about heavyweight. Legitimately everything I dislike about heavyweight. That blob status, doesn't have fun fights. Had one of the worst fights I've ever seen with him against Jairzinho Rosendrake, and that says a lot because we've had a lot of Apex fight nights. But I think that that one takes the cake as the worst fight I've watched inside the Apex. So there's really nothing to like about him. Outside the cage, I don't like anything. Inside the cage, I don't like anything. So I'm grasping at straws here. I am grasping at straws. I'm like, what the fuck do I like about Shamil Gaziev? Please give me one thing that's likable. And what's the one thing that's likable about Shamil Gaziev? At least he's a striker. At least he's a striker. Uh, like, at least he's not going out there and he's as boring as he is inside and outside the cage. And he's wrestling. And his cardio is super, super bad. And he's just diving on single legs and double legs for the entire fight. At least he's getting out there and he's trying to strike with guys, if nothing else. And if Shamil Gaziev got in shape, and that's a lot to say for Shamil Gaziev because that's pretty much like taking away his whole brand. But he has potential to be fun. He has potential to be good. We've seen him get finishes in the past. Right now, it's awful. It's not looking good. But at least there's some potential with Shamil Gaziev. And then the final guy that I have down here is a guy that I never thought would be on this list. I'll be honest with you. If you asked me a year ago, if you asked me six months ago, I would have been super, super surprised to see this guy on this list. It's Robles de España. Robles de España was the chosen one. 
He was the guy at heavyweight. He was the guy that was going to challenge Tom Aspinall. He was the guy that was going to make that heavyweight division fun. We obviously all saw the knockout compilations, him getting a knockout in five seconds, in 10 seconds. And he comes into the UFC and gets a finish inside the first minute. And then he fucked us all over. He fucked us all over. He made heavyweight dog shit again because we realized if Waldo Cortez Acosta is able to wrestle you for 15 minutes and you're not able to land your biggest shot and even your biggest shot doesn't knock him out, you're probably finished at this UFC level, especially the way that he's 36, 37 years old. But his saving grace is at least, if you put him up against bums, he's always going to be fun. He's always going to be box office. He's always going to be fun to watch if you get him the correct matchup, which I think the UFC are going to be smart and they're going to do. They're going to get Rob Elise de España matchups where he's always going to be the favorite, matchups where he can showcase that round one KO power. And that's what I like about him. That's what I like about him is that at least he has a lane inside the UFC to be that kind of freak show heavyweight that we haven't had in a while. But that is saying good things about every UFC fighter that I dislike. Make sure to like, sub to the YouTube channel. I'll catch you boys tomorrow. Peace.